Hi everyone, this is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology and today I'm hanging out again with my friend Kat from thecreativeintrovert.com. Kat helps me gather all of your questions into um, fun little Q&A uh, interviews that she does with me. I find it a little bit easier to answer Q&As like this. So thanks for being here again, Kat. And uh, what are we doing today? We're going to do uh, part two of um, a, a series that I guess we're doing about the planets and maybe clearing up some misconceptions about them and expanding our understanding of them. So in this part, we're going to be talking about um, Jupiter outwards. Okay, so starting with Jupiter, the word that I have for Jupiter that I'd like you to expand on is abundance. Abundance. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a good one for Jupiter. It really is. It's not that far off. But if you think about what, again, first you have to place the planet into the cosmology and into the metaphysics, like we were saying in the first part of this series. So in the cosmos, Jupiter holds the place of being like the cosmic unifier. And in this realm, that tends to mean law, which people don't think of when they think of Jupiter because they, think of, they tend to think of Saturn when they think of law, but that's because they're thinking of law in terms of something oppressive. What we're talking about is law as something unifying. For example, um, what makes it safe to walk around in the world? It's because in many societies anyway, it's not safe everywhere, obviously, but in many societies, there are civil laws and there's civil rights. You have as a citizen, as a, a, a individual being, you are thought to have certain rights that have to be respected. And if they're not respected, there will be punishment. And that's a justice system. So that was Zeus's role. He was like the cosmocrat. He was the one that kept law and order and unity amongst the gods by being the lawgiver. Um, but he's the lawgiver also in the sense that music has laws that create the beauty of the musical scale. Um, the cosmos as harmonia in, um, in the West, Rita in Indian cosmology, is that th these laws create a larger sense of wholeness and completeness and justice and balance and beauty. So, um, uh, so it's very important to understand that Zeus Jupiter has that role as kind of cosmic order supplier. And the order is not really thought to be, it's, it's thought, I mean, remember Jupiter is the one who liberates from Saturn. He's the one who takes over from Saturn, who's this kind of cruel, oppressive, tyrannical um, ruler, a father figure that he overthrows and he starts this new age, right? Well, what, what would that mean? It means that he's going to establish a new order, a new way of doing things that gives greater happiness to people. So, flowing out from that role as the sort of positive cosmic harmony order builder. Um, one of the things that comes with that is the feeling of abundance. So an abundance isn't, uh, people often think of that in terms of possessions, which is a very mundane level of the word, even the word abundance. So when you think of the abundance of Jupiter, um, did you ever see a Christmas carol? Yeah, which right. version? Yeah, I know. There's so many. Um, <laughs> the ghost of Christmas present who has the cornucopia, he's the big jolly guy. He's very jovial. He's like Zeus. And he's got the horn of plenty. And um, what his message for Scrooge is basically is that the present is so abundant and you're not seeing it, right? And so the sense that we live in a world like, like right now, you know, even though there's so many problems, it really is a miracle that I can live in a community that's relatively safe to walk outside. You know what I mean? Especially considering how nature is. It's not safe for a cat to walk outside during the nighttime in my neighborhood. You know what I mean? It's insane it is, that we can do this in yeah, itself. Yeah, like exactly. Things. Yeah, 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 exactly. So that that's an abundance. That's a state of abundance that Jupiter is pointing toward that. We tend to think of abundance as things like that are very opulent, but for the ancient people, abundance was really a way of saying that life is good, that life is whole, that the universe is ordered and complete. And just a, kind of like a clarifier question, because I was reading about this the other day, this concept that I think is in Plato's laws, maybe, but basically talking about different kinds of equality. So there's the difference between Jupiter, let's say, giving the same abundant 
gifts of whatever it is to, to everyone versus Jupiter and maybe that law abiding side of him distributing things um, accordingly based on, I don't know, people's merit or virtue or whatever. Or their karma. Um, yeah. To use yeah. an Indian word. Yeah. That that's certainly true as well, that, that he's like the Pez dispenser of abundance, but you have to remember that what's really complicated about karma is that, you know, first of all, all karma is sort of bad karma from the esoteric standpoint. So start there because it helps. And then, think of it in terms of um, that it's not, it's merit based, but that it's not directly correlated to like, like people who have a lot of money and power in the world, they may be appearing to be receiving Jupiter's benefits and favor, but actually from the standpoint of karma, it's like they, they're, it's like they're getting fed something with um, a huge amount of like corn syrup in it. So it, it, you have to be really, really careful with what you judge to be good or bad karma. And Jupiter will deliver abundance, but sometimes that abundance is a poison. And it's not that Jupiter is just a jackass that likes to give riches to people who don't deserve, who might deserve a kick in the pants better than you know another million dollars. It's that you have to understand that the Jupiter sometimes is like... Um, did you ever see Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory? Yeah, yeah. Let me give you a perfect example of Jupiter's um, way of doling out abundance. Remember that girl, Violet Beauregard, who like really wanted to eat the bubble gum? And she was like, absolutely not listening to anyone. She was super selfish and bratty. And she was like, oh, it's like a four course dinner. And then she was like, here comes the dessert. It's blueberry pie. And then she turns into a big blueberry. You're turning violet, Violet. <laughs> violet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's perfect. Yeah, that's Jupiter can distribute, you know, 500 pounds of weight if he wants to as well. So there, there's definitely, you have to be really careful about thinking of abundance in overly linear manner when it comes to the way that dis he distributes like wealth and abundance in a material sense. I think we successfully th threw a wet blanket onto Jupiter, the joys of Jupiter. <laughs> um, so uh, let's move on to Saturn. Uh, my word for Saturn is structure. Oh, that's probably my least favorite one of all. I know. I, I, so I know. I've done a whole big, like, long talk on this before. I've done several talks on this before. Yeah, I mean, so Saturn isn't structure. Saturn is, um, you could say, I mean, Saturn can be... Saturn can be related to things like structure, but Saturn, it's, again, it's a word that emanates from the core metaphysical meaning of Saturn. Saturn is the boundary keeper between the visible and the invisible, um, the farthest, dimmest, distant planet, but also the closest to heaven in a sense. So when you are someone who um, lives with that thing, that sense of distance, cold remote distance um that that gives you that you can see where someone gets that kind of twenty thousand feet view of things and sometimes that will be associated with people who tend to look at the big picture like an engineer or a scientist or um a landscaper or you know someone who can kind of zoom out see the big picture and see the larger framework of things and so that can be associated with structure um, but also it has to do with insiders versus outsiders. Those who are dim and distant and uh, cold and outside versus those who are inside. And how do we divide those who are inside versus outside? We tend to set up hierarchies that only allow for the entrance or privileging of of certain people and that push other people to the margins. And Saturn is the God that represents the margin between what is status quo and what is outsider. And so you're, this, the, the way that structure relates to Saturn is actually, you know, it's very abstract. So you have to, you have to think about it a little bit. For example, if someone says, um, you know, uh, what can we say? If someone's really, really dogmatic about something like their church and they only go to their church and they're only like, and it's only the people that go to my church and believe my specific doctrines and stuff like that. Um, 
then they will tend to be more strict and rigid and oppressive and they'll be like structuralists and they're thinking they'll feel sort of mechanical and that's where that comes in. But what that is really a response to is that Saturnine people feel more acutely the difference between what is inside and what is out. And um, they'll respond to that either in terms of being the melancholic, the contemplative, the mystic, the scientist, the broad-minded but sort of spacey person that's all saturn stuff that's aquarian that's a you know that's a rulership of aquarius but also it's uh, like saturnine people are hugely into like fantasy and science fiction like jrr tolkien george rr R. martin all these or whatever his name is george r martin or whatever all these a lot of these people have capricorn and saturnine influences also because they're able to step back and view the world from so far away that they they're able to see it as a fantasy to see other worlds to so saturn was deeply imaginative to ancient people and um but also potentially you know like ebenezer scrooge he, he in his on his gravestone you know he's a, he's a capricorn or aquarius he's one of the two on his gravestone and he is like very miserly Right. And, and right that, that, but what is his childhood story of Ebenezer Scrooge? His childhood story is that he got sent off to a boarding school, you know, and was there by himself over winter break. And like, so, and then he becomes the sort of rigid like that, but that's, those are, that's the, that it's not that a Saturnine person is inherently a structuralist as much as it is that that becomes a response to a feeling of being alienated or alone or of suffering or of distance, remoteness. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, that idea of a big picture stuff I had just associated with Jupiter. So that's really yeah. And Saturn is also like cosmically is related to the fact that everything will end. You know, whatever Jupiter says, here's the order of the cosmos. It's like, yeah, but you know what? Eventually, you're going to become like me, an old man, an old man who gets kicked out, or an old person, an old generation, and something new comes along. So no matter what we think of in the mundane sphere as providing us with that sense of abundance and goodness and harmony and order, there will eventually again be disorder. That's why Jupiter and Saturn are paired together in a very similar way in the cosmology um, as Venus and Mars are, um, you know, or as the lights are, they're, they're these pairings and Mercury is the one who's always bringing the pairings together and there's so many pairings, but Jupiter Saturn is another such pairing because you have the sense of boundless new possibilities. And the, you know, it's like, it's like the, the bright eyed optimism of people at the outset of a great endeavor or like democracy or the French revolution or something like that. What they don't realize is that, you know, eventually the sun will set on this and that Saturn, Saturn holds that place as well of endings. Yeah. And it's like a cosmic, like checks and balance and system um it's never just going to be one or the other yeah right yeah exactly um okay so let's move on to the outer planets now so starting with uranus um surprise <laughs> or, or, or shocks in general surprises or shocks yeah now the outer planets of course were now were not they didn't have a role in the ancient cosmology so i'm i'm speculating more here but based on what my favorite thinkers have said, and I would take that when it comes to the outer planets, I take up on the same philosophy or philosophical lines as um, Richard Tarnas, who wrote Cosmos and Psyche. He's, I think he's one of the great sort of modern masters and, and, you know, he's had a lot to say about the outer planets. Uranus is, what do I want to say? Uranus is like the uh, tower card in the tarot where there's, there is a sudden quality, but the sudden quality is, uh, again, it's an emanation of a more core archetypal event, which tends to be disruption of the status quo. And so for the status quo to be d disrupted, there has to be this kind of sudden, shocking, eccentric jolt. And the purpose, you could say, of disturbing systems is not even a purpose. It's just that this happens to stable systems, that stable systems eventually get hit by a wave, a jolt, a shock, a lightning bolt, something that comes suddenly and oftentimes repetitively to um, break the, whatever the system is of its 
current way of being. Um, and people take that, I think, and rather than seeing it as an eternal archetype, they, they filter it into the lens of like linear progress in time. And they say Uranus comes to make everything better and more progressive. But that's not true because often Uranus comes and disrupts things in ways that are very violent, tyrannical, selfish, materialistic. So you can't, it's still just an archetype at the end of the day. Uranus isn't the god of everything getting better. And do you think there's, um, maybe this is outside the scope of this particular episode, but like a, a way to respond to that, that, you know, that the archetype kind of asks for. In a way. Yeah. I mean, if you're in a Uranian period of your life, keep yourself open. And when mm. the shocks come, consider that they are meaningful and respond as though someone's asking you to make a meaningful change. Um, be careful of trying to change everything in the name of everything getting instantly better because that tends to polarize you with the past and that will eventually come back to bite you. That's great. Thank you. Um, Neptune. Illusion. Well, and again, it's a good one, you know, and that's a g great word for Neptune. But what is like, what Neptune is to me, like one of the words that I like for Neptune is deception, mostly because I feel like people are very, people have ironically a lot of illusions, delusions, aggrandizements, inflations, intoxications, all like Neptunian words about Neptune. <laughs> Because the thing that people tend to think most about Neptune in, in modern astrology that I've heard more than I can, you know, more times than I can count is that Neptune is the spiritual mystical planet. Um, and that's really problematic because for ancient astrologers, every single planet was mystical. Reality itself is mystical. The study of astrology is mystical. You know what I mean? Um, and so you don't give a planet mysticism, first of all. It's just not cool. Um, and um, so then you have to understand what is meant by this. So what it, it turns out that what most people think of as mystical is often a kind of illusion. I'll give an example. So I drank ayahuasca for like 10 years of my life. During those 10 years, um, in the beginning, I was really caught up in the visions that were induced by this plant medicine from the Amazon, meaning that the visions themselves were to me the most amazing thing. What I did in having these sort of mystical otherworldly experiences was to share them with a lot of people and watch other people be mystified, right? And then what did that do for my ego? It made me feel quite special. You know what I mean? And as I went on, the shamans, thank God, you know, who are very wise and have been through thousands and thousands of ceremonies, they were able to progressively teach me and others, many, you know, this is what I think good shamans teach, is that, yeah, that's not actually, that's not actually the important thing. The important thing is that you went home and stopped drinking. The important thing was that, you know, and your consciousness is changing because mystical experiences don't take away the fact that I'm still... I'm still a chuta, you know, and I've still got to come home. I've got kids. I've got a life. I've got, so mystical um, experiences are often a red herring as are like, for example, sometimes people in a yoga class, they'll be like, oh my God, that like, you can tell that they're high afterward. And we would sometimes have to say after certain types of yoga classes, take a few minutes before you get into your car, you know, cause people would be so high and people mistake that high for yoga. So even in the yogic scriptures, one of the biggest tests or challenges is that as a person spiritualizes, they start seeing, witnessing, and even developing the, the cities, which are mystical powers. You start just, you know, your dreams become more active or you can, you just suddenly, it's like, hey, I've got a, I've suddenly, I've got a little bit of citizenship in the spiritual reality. I can see it more. I, you know, it's there more. And then people think that somehow it is that that makes them special or it, that that itself is the point. But the, the reason it can't be the point is because that would only ever be special from, your, from the standpoint of your relative little self. It's only really special and amazing from the standpoint of someone who's like, oh my God, let's make a real world show about mystical experiences and really everyone will be wowed and we'll get great ratings or something like that. You, you know, for, how do you normalize to a mystical experience? How does a mystical experience not become something to yap about all the time, right? And that's, that's the big problem with Neptune is that 
people, because Neptune has some association or affiliation with, let's say, mystical experiences, otherworldly experiences, etc., that people tend to glamorize Neptune, but they forget that Neptune is also the planet of glamour, of illusion, of intoxication, which it turns out mysticism goes hand in hand with. So in, in yoga, they say, you know, there's a, there, mysticism is, it's almost like you're walking through a veil to see what, it, what larger reality and what larger self looks like. But as you're walking through the veil, you know, it's filled with glitter and you're walking through it and you're like, oh my God, like I'm, so it, it, that mystical experience is reflective of a transition from one state of consciousness to something a lot bigger, which Neptune is a part of that transcendentalizing experience. But it's also responsible for people starting to get lost and, and confusing the liminal state, the transitional state between mundane and higher consciousness for the goal of spirituality itself, which it never is. That's why it's also a hall of mirrors that people get lost in. It's a testing ground as well. You can't just people, a lot of the times people think that they're living a spiritual life and really their whole life is caught up in a culture of mysticism. And that's, that's like they're, they're getting caught in the veil and they think that that's spirituality. Yeah, it's like liking the idea of spirituality or mystical experiences more than the actual thing. Um, and like you said, that, that being a kind of test at the threshold. Yeah. I mean, for example, one really great way of thinking about this, when I was in Calcutta, I went and I saw, you know, Mother Teresa's convent and there were written diary entries. And this is someone, of course, who had some really mystical experiences in her life. Um, and, um, and I know for, it's weird. Every time I mention mother Teresa, there's always a few people out there who love to criticize and like, cause there's, there's a lot of people like, as soon as you bring up her name, she's very controversial. Anyway, I'm just going to focus on the good, uh, try to take the good from her life story. And, um, when you look at her diary entries from the end of her life, she was in a deeply depressive, melancholic mood with God, like in her communication. And um, Neptune doesn't have a lot of room for that. Neptune tends to like things to be a little bit more sparkly and will tend to think of like, I shouldn't say Neptune does. I, I think what I'm trying to say is that people who uh, think of Neptune in this particularly romanticized way, that they don't have room for understanding that mysticism is also found in grief, which Neptune is also associated with, in boredom, which Neptune is also associated with, in longing and desperation, in a feeling of um, internal uh, discontent, divine discontent, that that's also a part of Neptune that gets kind of left beside, unfortunately. And doubt is the other word that I was thinking of then. Perfect. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, people always think, oh, it's Saturn or it's Mercury or something like that that has to do with doubt. But you just put Neptune in contact with Mercury in your birth chart or the sun uh, in your birth chart and watch what kind of doubts and confusion and things like that come in. And they're, But they're really meaningful. They're, if you can stick with them and let them just be what they are and, and kind of uh, become companions with them they, they become a part of what is guiding us into this numinous transcendentalized understanding and, and uh wrapping things up with pluto uh so it's your favorite death and rebirth <laughs> right i mean again i concede it's a really good one for pluto it is a really like there is this kind of regenerative thing but the the thing about death and rebirth <clears throat> is that I always joke about this, you know, there are people who are sort of addicted to death and rebirth, you know, like it's like a roller coaster ride. Like, uh, you know, I see, you know, and I know that some of this is probably, you know, people are dealing with a lot out there and, and sometimes mental, emotional um, problems and stuff like that. But on social media, I see people who are always like on a seesaw between I once was lost and now I'm found. I'm owning my power again. I give up a blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, two weeks later, it's like, I gave my power away again. And so now I'm getting it back or just this kind of thing. This, this roller coaster that we go through, and I'm not immune to it. I go through it sometimes too. But this roller coaster um, of extreme, you know, kind of, uh, I'm in, I'm neck deep in my own shit, you know, and then I'm, and then I'm, I'm feeling reborn again. That's not Pluto. That's just, that's just, that's just narcissism. And if you do that, like every 
Sunday night or something. That's what I'm saying. Like that, yeah, just that yeah. kind of, the kind of seesaw of like, it was really rough and intense. And then it like, and then I like suddenly feel good and like that. No, that's just, that's just standard human drama. You know what I mean? And, and we do that. It's a, that is a symptom of us not usually having like a good spiritual practices in our life. Like we need to, we need to be working to overcome being on that seesaw all the time. And sometimes people glorify it by being like, Oh, I'm just really Plutonian or I have a really strong Pluto or blah, blah, blah. And it's like, I'm not trying to be a ball buster, but it's kind of like, yeah, we need to get over that. Cause that's not really helping us with anything. Um, and, but what Pluto does that's truly remarkable um, and some people will experience it more regularly, though it does not, it's, it's not always healthy. It can be very, very destructive. Um, what Pluto is going to do is, is force a catharsis of things that have been pent up, subterranean, repressed, rejected, discarded, things that we don't want to look at, the monster in the basement, whatever it might be, however mundane it might be too. It doesn't have to be like a, a horror movie, but it, it, it eventually in time, you know, the, the physics is such that it, it just has a way of bursting up where it can be seen and dealt with and understood. It's like, I'm not going to clean my fridge because I'm just, I'm forgetting about it. And then you open it up and something has expired and it stinks. The whole thing stinks. So like someday at some point it turns and then, and you you have to face it and deal with it. And to say that that is hands down the point of spiritual life is really reckless because Spiritual life should also be taking us into a place that is more conscious, specifically so that we don't need to have a little, you know, a stink pit appearing in our life every three days that then we get to triumph over and feel really good about. Because that, that, again, that teeter-totter will um, wear us down and wear other people down too. Yeah, the phrase that just came up for me there was, um, it's the place that you least want to look. Um, but the best things are found basically in that place. Uh, maybe not in the back of your fridge, but it still needs to be dealt with. Um, yeah. Whereas if you're doing it too regularly, maybe that's, it doesn't become the actual place. It's just a kind of, um, I don't know, a distraction. Yeah. Well, you never hear anybody else sort of glorify. I mean, it's weird how Pluto gets glorified like that. Um, it's a part of Pluto's symbolism that P Pluto is glorified in this kind of dark reveling way, revelatory and, you know, um, kind of chthonic ecstasy that's associated. It's very Dionysian. And I'm just saying, you know, people like, it is archetypal that Dionysus is associated with kind of destruction, chaos, drunkenness, and ecstasy all at once. So when Pluto appears, it can be very chaotic like that. And it can, we can get kind of drunk and high on it. Again, I am not, what am I going to say about an archetype that it shouldn't exist? No, but we need to be careful because there's maybe not any God that's as seductive as Pluto. Like there's a reason Pluto is associated with cults, for example, where um, there's just, what I'm saying is that in the new age, there's a kind of cult. It's like a personality cult where people are obsessed with and revel in this kind of destruction and regeneration of psychological problems and, and then rebirth and victory over those problems cyclically. And um, what I want to say is that that, that, that that is not people sometimes will say, well, like that's spiritual life and like, no, that's actually an archetype that you're caught up in. And the point of yoga is to become aware of all the different archetypes um, and to have a relationship with them that's conscious. And so it's not that there isn't a place for those kinds of experiences. It's that again, we don't want to be seduct seduced into thinking that that, that that experience is what defines spiritual progress. Just that teeter totter of catharsis all the time. Yeah. great so i think that's a wrap on the planets thank you for clarifying all of those for me yeah thanks these were really fun so make sure everyone that you check out cat's work at the creative introvert.com and um remember my class is coming up ancient astrology for the modern mystic it starts in november on saturdays 30 classes on the year 12 guest lectures you can watch the classes remotely we record them or you can participate live in the webinars last third of class we have live clients come in it's a pretty cool experience um, it's a great training program if you're looking for a good solid foundation in ancient astrology. Uh, Kat's, Kat's been in my class before, uh, so she can, maybe we'll Highly talk about it sometime. Yeah. Good. Yeah. That's, so check it out on my website, nightlightastrology.com. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Take it easy, everyone. Bye.